is a motion on the High Quality Affordable Child Care. I'll ask the clerk to read the motion. That this Assembly recognises that the costs of childcare are unaffordable for many and that hard working families are struggling every month to meet these costs. Further recognises that the childcare sector is in need of urgent and significant investment in order to put the sector on a sustainable footing, to improve terms and conditions for workers, and to deliver the high quality and accessible provision that families and children deserve. Notes that without affordable childcare provision, many people, particularly women, are unable to take up or return to employment. Agrees that affordable childcare would have a hugely positive impact on our local economy. Acknowledges that high quality childcare and early years education can help to give children the best start in life. Support children with special educational needs to help address educational disadvantage and promote emotional health and well-being amongst children and calls on the executive to work collectively to deliver a strategy which makes high quality childcare affordable for all families a priority. Thank you. I call Nicola Brogan to move the motion. The committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and thirty minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have ten minutes to propose and ten minutes to wind. As an amendment was selected and published in the Marshall List, the business committee has agreed that fifteen minutes will be added to the total time of the debate. So please open the debate on the motion. Thank you. Um, I'm really pleased to be here this afternoon and to move this motion on behalf of Sinn Fein. And I'm really delighted that one of the first motions to be debated in this new assembly is on the need to prioritise high quality, affordable childcare. For almost two years, in the absence of a functioning assembly and executive, the Assembly's All Party Group on Early Education and Childcare has worked tirelessly to address the serious issues and concerns facing the childcare sector. And it is testament to the childcare providers, childcare users, and organisations involved in the All Party Group that we're here today debating childcare at the earliest opportunity. As chairperson of the All Party Group, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of those involved in the group for their invaluable input to the meetings. Members are very honest about their personal challenges and the struggles within the sector, and parents and users are so forthcoming with the um, serious problems they face in trying to pay for childcare. Um, I'd like to give a special thank you to Aoife Hamilton and Employers for Childcare for the work that they do as Secretary of the All Party Group. IFA, Employers for Childcare and the All Party Group members have been a driving force in ensuring that the early years in childcare strategy is not only progressed, but that it is ambitious and meets the needs of children, families and providers across the North, and that the expertise, knowledge and views of those within the sector are taken into consideration throughout the development of the strategy. Whilst the work of the All Party Group has been of great value, further progress was stalled in the absence of an executive. This motion calls on the executive to work collectively to deliver a strategy which makes high quality childcare affordable for all families a priority. It is clear to see that childcare is a massive issue for people right across the north right now. Very often we hear about the rising cost of childcare and the impact this has on parents and families who are already struggling with the cost of living. We talk about the very real and very concerning pressures that our childcare providers are facing right now in trying to keep their doors open with increased operating costs and difficulties in recruit recruiting and retaining staff. And we saw just last week that another day nursery in Lisburn will have to close its doors this month because of increasing costs and staffing pressures. This is not only putting untold pressure on families to find new childcare arrangements in just a matter of weeks, but it's also putting hardworking staff out of work. We really need to do better for everyone involved here. We also understand how poor childcare provision is a massive barrier to women trying to join the labour market or to get back into work after having a family, and the detrimental effect that this has on the local economy. In rural areas like my own constituency of West Rhone, it's particularly difficult for parents to find adequate childcare provision, with many relying heavily on the support of grandparents and extended family. We must do more to improve the access to suitable childcare in areas right across the north. This includes adequate childcare for families with children with special educational needs. Children with additional needs in their families have been overlooked and neglected for far too long. We must ensure that a new early years in childcare strategy focuses on meeting their needs as well as others. It's also crucially important that we recognise the role of early education in childcare in helping to lift families out of poverty. High quality affordable childcare plays an essential role in tackling disadvantage by enabling parents to work and helping giving children and young people the best start in life. Kingorla, there is no doubt that the cost of childcare is having a crippling effect on families in the North right now. According to Employer for Childcare's most recent survey in 2023, 
The current average cost for a full-time childcare place is £10,036 £10, per year. That is an increase of 14 per cent since 2021. For 41 per cent of families, childcare is the largest monthly outgoing ahead of mortgage or rental costs. And 56 per cent of families are having to use means other than their income to pay for childcare, including savings, credit cards and loans. These costs are simply unaffordable for families. They place an unfair burden on families already struggling, and it's unacceptable that they're being put in this position. We really need to see urgent and significant investment in the childcare sector. As chair of the all-party group, together with fellow members, I've listened to many people sharing their experiences and concerns about both delivering and availing of childcare. We've also looked at the delivery of childcare in different jurisdictions and by different countries. What's become abundantly, abundantly clear is that delivering a childcare Delivering childcare in a fair and sustainable way is difficult. Producing a properly funded childcare strategy that delivers quality care for children, affordability for their parents and sustainability to providers isn't going to be easy. But it is crucial that we get it right. And it's important that we create our own childcare model and strategy that works for the people of the North. We expect a strategy that puts the interests of the child at its core, that supports early development, addresses disadvantage, meets special educational needs and supports the childcare workforce. We want childcare to be affordable, supporting parents to return to work or to take up new employment opportunities. As part of the All Party Group's work, we have examined England's scheme which claims to offer 30 hours of free childcare. Whilst this sounds good, in practice it is not meeting the needs of parents, providers or children. We need our own model, one that ensures the sustainability of the sector by protecting workers' conditions and pay, and one that reduces fees for parents to drive down the costs for families. This approach would improve the sector's financial sustainability, thereby attracting new childcare providers. It would make childcare more affordable for parents, and it would make it easier to attract and retain childcare staff. And this approach would create a relationship between government and the sector, which could be harnessed to maintain the high standards within the sector and ensure a focus on childcare's educational benefits. We expect childcare providers to do a lot of the heavy lifting, but providers can only support us if we support them. The sector employs around 10,000 people, the vast majority of whom are women. According to the Federation of Small Businesses, businesses within the childcare sector are most likely to be headed up by women. Providers also include charities, local voluntary groups, non-for-profit um, social enterprises and self-employed childminders. In a recent survey, more than 40% of childcare providers described their financial situation as struggling. Over 80% were making a loss or just breaking even. Without direct uh, support, more than three quarters anticipated increasing their fees. And the current mechanisms of support, for example, the tax free childcare, does not meet the needs of many families here. We really have an exciting opportunity right now to deliver a, a top class early years and childcare strategy. But as I say, we must get it right. And I urge um, the Minister for Education to work with us, to engage extensively with the experts in the field who have the experience and understanding of what is needed to protect the sector and to help it flourish for the benefit of us all and to co-design the strategy with childcare providers, with parents, with businesses right across the economy and with those involved in inspection and regulation of the services. Um, I also think it would be important to for the Minister to, and to consider re-establishing a childcare reference group to deal with live issues that are um, facing the sector um, at, at the moment, um, I suppose, as we're waiting on the strategy to be actually implemented. Um, I would also urge the Minister to clearly set out a timeline for the publication of the Early Years in Childcare Strategy to ensure that there are no more delays to its development. Sinn Féin wants to see urgent and significant investment delivered to the childcare sector so we can support the development of children, including children with special educational needs, reduce the cost of childcare for parents, ensure the childcare sector is sustainable and supported, supported and recognise the invaluable work of childcare staff and improve their pay conditions. I hope you will all work with us and support this motion. Nicola, thank you very much. I call on Robbie Butler to move the amendment. Moved. Thank you, Robbie. You have you have ten minutes to propose the amendment, and Mick, you'll have five minutes to wind on the amendment. So please open the debate on the amendment. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, you'll be glad to know, perhaps some of you, that there was a printer malfunction in my office up the stairs. So. I don't have a, a, a very well-crafted written speech like the member across the chamber, so I'm going to be kind of winging this. But the, the good thing about winging this topic is that we've been talking about it now for around two years, particularly on the all-party group, which uh, the member uh, chairs 
uh, brilliantly. And it's been uh, quite a journey on that old party group. And I'd like to mirror the, the chair's comments, if that's OK, with regard to the secretariat support we get from employers for childcare, and in particular from Aoife Hamilton. Um, I'm going to ask the members uh, if they would, because I know this is a, a very important subject and matter for all of the parties, because there were a number of amendments that had been tabled to the Speaker's office. Um, thankfully, ours was accepted. And I think, um, if the members opposite and, and in the chamber will, will indulge me, that the, the amendments are quite uh, moderate, but very important. It's only a couple of words of change. And I'm going to outline at the very start why I've changed perhaps the first word. So uh, the amendment at the very start, without uh, reading it verbatim, replaces the word uh, address with to prevent. And I think in terms of what we do as legislators, we need to be a lot more deliberate about the language that we choose uh, when we're proposing ambitious strategies, policies or plans to help change the lives of those people um, that we purport to support. I'll, I will expand a little bit more as to why I think that to be important. But in the last uh, debate that we had in this chamber earlier with the Education Minister, it was brilliant to see the amount of members that were speaking particularly to special education needs, children with disabilities and those who need additional supports. Um, as has already been said, we probably will repeat this many times, but why do we need to do this? Well, there are a number of reasons. Absolutely. Given way, just as you have mentioned, those with special educational needs, I would like the Minister to consider specifically this issue because I have been contacted by a number of families who have children with special needs who are having real difficulty accessing any type of childcare because there is a reluctance and a fear among the childcare providers because they're not getting the support that they need in order to be able to give those children the attention and the supports that they need. <coughs> Member for her intervention, and um, I, I'm going to jump, just jump on that now. I think it's better to do that than to, to try and jump about in the, the mess that I've written down here. But it's a point I was going to raise um, because um, a, a constituent of mine, and will be a constituent of the minister's, has contacted me within this very week. And one of the issues for the sector is, is, is that they, they, they obviously there's not enough spaces for parents that are applying. But then that's further compounded for families with a child who perhaps has some other difficulties and needs additional support. And the businesses, the sector doesn't have the capacity to support that family. And unfortunately, children at their very earliest age are facing discrimination, unintended discrimination, but because they can't access those childcare uh, services that, that other children can, then unfortunately um, they are being disadvantaged at the earliest point of their life. And the Minister will know, as will all of the members in this chamber, that we and our inboxes are becoming inundated um, with many parents about uh, Northern Ireland with regard to the difficulties that they are facing, which are twofold. One is the high cost and the unaffordability of childcare, and secondly, it is that availability and accessibility. And we also have the business sector, which are now ponying up to get involved in this conversation. And that's the second part of my amendment, because what I want to see happen here is that when the minister does embark on this policy plan, and that, that not just parents' voices uh, are included in this co-design and co-production, but those who represent the business sector, we've got the FSB, we've got CBI, and we have the, the, the women in business who are now contacting us and reiterating the absolute need to have their voices heard to ensure that what is crafted and created speaks to them and actually does meet the need. But you would be surprised if I didn't speak up for children in the first point uh, today, Minister, because childcare should be centred on the child. It really needs to be built around the child. And one of the things that I'd like to ask you is to reflect on the recommendations that we have already heard about in Fair Start and indeed in the most recent independent review of education, because they're all pointing the same way. But I hope that your department will be one of the more ambitious departments in terms of deploying what is termed Children's Rights Impact Assessment, CRIAs, and I would like to see perhaps if this is one of the first policies that actually has that embedded throughout it, because if we are serious about tackling uh, uh, disadvantage, educational underachievement, and barriers to uh, full life experience for all of our children, well, we need to ensure that these key policies, which is a piece of infrastructure, by the way, for everyone, but it addresses the needs of the child. So why are we doing this? And, and I know the member across um, uh, that, 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 that brought the, the motion to us has alluded to the fact that it's costing on average over £10,000. When you break that down, I think 25% of parents are paying over £1,000 
per month. And when you are faced with a bill like that, and you add on the cost of living crisis that we're in, the crippling mortgage rates, the fuel prices, the fuel, uh, food inflation, it means that parents and families are having to make decisions. Um, I have two grown-up kids, as you know, and I, and I have three little kids, and I found myself um, with the first two, I didn't need childcare. I, I worked shifts in the fire service, so it was okay. Uh, but now I find myself, my wife, my wife has had to make a decision with regard to that. She's a nurse, and she had to reduce her hours to 30 hours per week. To, to facilitate the difficulties, not just access in childcare, but also how you do that mechanically. And that is something that needs to be picked up, perhaps, um, when the minister uh, responds. And has already been picked up, that gender disparity, and I'm displaying it in my own blinking house, uh, where my, my wife, I try and be as flexible as I can to pick up um, that need. But unfortunately, the way we're set up at the moment, women, again, shouldn't be discriminated against, but unfortunately, an unintended consequence is that they are. But it's not just in terms of accessing work. We know that when we're in work, working full time, we get access to higher levels of training. We get those opportunities for promotion and, and that career enhancement, and that shouldn't be the case in 2024. And I want to just talk, um, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, about an issue with regard to the availability of places as well. And the Minister will be well aware of the difficulties in our own constituency of Lagan Valley. And very, very sadly, uh, this week there was an announcement that one of our longest established and best childcare facilities, Birdies, um, has announced its intention to close its doors. Now, I don't know the absolute detail of that, but I suspect that part of the, de the, the, the issue there is around staff. Uh, the availability of staff and fair pay for staff. And we're in this position where um, we want to pay and we should pay those people uh, a good wage. We should have professional training for them. But how do we do that? Because the, the, the centres are faced with crippling costs, whether that's fuel, rent, rates, whatever it is, but also trying to pay their staff. And the staff just aren't there anymore. It's just one of those places which is so hard uh, to recruit into. And again, that is something that a, a, a full circle strategy, I hope, will indeed uh, speak to. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, um, I think to go to the, this, the point that, that was raised by uh, Ms. Dillon, uh, recently I had a, 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 a parent a, a contact me about um, the... the the barriers that she is now facing for her, her, her child. And that centres in and around the fact that um, there are additional needs for that child. And that is why, I suppose, I, I'm quite happy today that, that in the amendments that we have offered to what is a, an excellent um, motion, which we will absolutely support, and I hope you will support ours, that in the co-design, co co-production of any strategy or plan that comes through, that those families who are facing the most challenging starts of life with their kids in terms of perhaps even assess, accessing weight and this in our health service, or that professional help with paediatricians, whether that's speech and language, that this isn't done in isolation. This is not a standalone policy. This is a policy which will speak into many, many policies, whether it's anti-poverty, uh, whether it is uh, the gender uh, imbalance in the, in the workplace, whether it is addressing educational underachievement. This policy needs really to be ensure that, to ensure that it has the capacity to speak across all of those sectors. Um, so I will just finish by saying this, that there is a wealth um, of evidence at hand, whether that's in the English model, the Scottish model, the Welsh model, or the model in the Republic of Ireland. There's a wide recognition um, that many of the issues that we're going to discuss today are well versed but needed to be faced into. But I'm just going to challenge the Minister that we need to see a co cost of options paper as soon as possible. That this assembly and the relevant committees can get their teeth into, but it needs to be co designed, it needs to be forward facing, it needs to be ambitious, it needs to be child centred, and it needs to underpin, uh, underpin an achievement that Northern Ireland can be proud of and that Northern Ireland can lead the way in uh, on these islands. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, um, Robbie, for, for that. I should have said it was remiss of me that all other speakers after yourself have five minutes. Okay. Um, as this is Cheryl Brownlee's first opportunity to speak as a private member, I want to remind the House that it is the Convention that a maiden speech or first speech is made without interruption. I call on Cheryl Brownlee. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. As I rise to make my maiden speech, I count it as a privilege that I can stand here today on the floor of this House 
and represent my home constituency of East Antrim. Today is a day of mixed emotions for me. While of course I'm filled with an overwhelming sense of pride, I also want to pause to remember and pay tribute to my late friend and colleague, David Hilditch, yeah. who served the people of East Antrim as an MLA from 1998 until his untimely passing last year. I count it as an honour for me, having worked with Davy in his constituency office for over 10 years, to have been trusted by my party to take his place and carry on his legacy. And I cannot thank them enough for entrusting me with this responsibility. I would also like to thank my family and send them all my love for all their support and particularly patience the last few months. Like Davy, I'm committed to serving all the people of East Antrim. And with the return of these institutions, we're faced with a fresh opportunity to deliver on the issues that really matter. Principal Deputy Speaker, I commend this motion and I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute to the discussions today. The provision of high quality, affordable childcare is something I am extremely passionate about. As a 19 year old lone parent, I have lived through the struggles of trying to access childcare, which is both affordable for a low income household, but still offers the high levels of care we expect for our little ones. I often hear people refer to childcare as a barrier, but I don't think it is. A barrier can be knocked down or navigated around. For some, childcare is a complete and utter brick wall. In my constituency of East Antrim, we have some incredible established childcare providers who undoubtedly offer an extremely high quality level of service. However, the stark reality is that people like me, whenever I was that 19 year old lone parent, working multiple jobs and struggling to make ends meet, I was priced out of this service. I'm sure I speak for all of us here today when I say I'm committed to striving for high quality, accessible and affordable childcare for everyone in Northern Ireland and I believe one of the critical pillars to this service are our childminders. For me, I've had the privilege of both my children to have been cared for lovingly and to have received an incredibly high standard of care from our childminders, Jenny and Paula. For people like Jenny and Paula and many others in this sector, increased regulations, demands and scrutiny have left them feeling pushed out. It is my belief and hope that this executive will offer more assistance in reducing the burden on our childminders. Principal Deputy Speaker, I was also particularly pleased to see the inclusion of children with additional educational needs within this motion today. My son Lyle has been referred and is currently going through the under fours pathway for children with additional needs and he also has type 1 diabetes. The infrastructure to support children like Lyle is not in place, meaning children are not receiving the critical intervention and support and resources that they so require. I know all too well the extra pressures and stress which this puts on parents with the, with the intensity of the process, the complexity of appointments and the constant psychological battle that comes with worrying whether you're doing the right thing or not. I'm proud of my party's track record on supporting childcare. When this sector was on the brink of collapse during the pandemic, it was a DUP minister who stepped up to support them. But we don't want to stop there. Our party has consistently campaigned to help working families by introducing 30 hours free childcare and we will continue in this pursuit. A recent survey by the DUP found out out of a thousand parents who were surveyed, a staggering 85% had their return to work impacted by childcare costs, with a quarter of parents also saying that childcare to assume nearly a full wage in their household. This, is, this is, has to be tackled. As I draw to a close, I once again want to reiterate my support for this motion. And I join in others here today calling on the executive to work collaboratively to deliver a strategy which makes high quality childcare affordable for all families as a priority as I believe the lack of affordable and high quality childcare will only serve to cripple families, stunt economic growth and curb our children's future opportunities. We must do more. Thank you. I call Kate Nicholl. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to uh, congratulate you on your elevation uh, uh, to the role and I wish you all the best in it. Um, I would also, this is uh, my, my maiden speech, so I'd like to pay tribute to Claire Bailey, my predecessor, who was a fierce champion for the environment, women's reproductive rights, social justice issues, and marginalized voices, and those are areas in which I will not fall short. Uh, Principal, Principal Deputy Speaker, I arrived in Belfast when I was 14 years old from Zimbabwe. 
and I've always been grateful to the city and its people um, for welcoming me and becoming my home when, when I no longer had one. And so much of what I do and what I did as a counselor was really um, out of a sense of duty and indebtedness, but also with a strong sense of having arrived as a child and feeling like an outsider and wanting to make sure that no other children felt that way. It's why I've done so much work with asylum seekers and, and refugees. When I was elected um, to the assembly, uh, I had stood for election um, for children, but this time because of my own. Um, my husband, Fogel Sherry, who's watching um, at the moment and was one of the other brilliant things to come out of moving to Belfast, um, and I are very proud to live in South Belfast and to be raising our children there. Whilst I was canvassing during the assembly election, heavily pregnant, Every day, multiple times, people would raise the issue of childcare. And it was something that I was experiencing in my own house, something my colleagues were experiencing in their houses. Constituents were, were, were suffering from the sheer, sheer lack of uh, affordable childcare in Northern Ireland. And I realized something needed to be done. And I made a promise that I would do everything within my power to address it if I got to the assembly. So here I am. Shortly after I was elected, Naomi Long appointed a childcare working group within the Alliance Party, a number of MLAs and researchers. And for the past two years, we've been put to work looking at childcare policy and how we can address the issues within it. We met with employers for childcare. Eva Hamilton has done amazing work on the all party group along with Nicola Bergen. It's a wonderful all party group to be in and has raised so many important issues that maybe haven't been brought to the fore before. Federation of Small Businesses, uh, the Northern Ireland Childminders Association, Northern Ireland Chamber, Melted Parents, some of whom are here today as well, Early Years, the Stram Millis Early Years Academics, the list goes on and on of stakeholders who have done such amazing work in the sector. And while they all brought different perspectives to the childcare crisis, there was one resounding message and that it was, there is a childcare crisis, and the crisis is now. So we developed our policies and we listened to stakeholders and we heard what they had to say and we saw what was happening across the water and how the free hours model is not working. It is not serving families. For a very small number, it works very well, but for the majority, it doesn't. It's actually widening inequalities and we need to address that. We have proposed an affordable bespoke childcare scheme, which is child-centered, which puts quality and flexibility and affordability and training and experience at the heart of our policy. We want to see supply side funding with requirements that providers ensure that these mechanisms are all met. Principal Deputy Speaker, there is a lot of work um, for the minister on and in his entry and I know from the several occasions I bumped into him in the corridor that childcare is going to be a priority of his and it is welcome and it is welcome that all the parties are united in prioritizing this but we have to get it right because childcare is not just babysitting it is child, ch child development early education early intervention it is a means by which to improve economic activity levels it is about gender equality in the labor market it is essential social and economic infrastructure and it has to be afford invested in accordingly. It's gonna be expensive, we know that, but it is far more expensive not to invest in it. So I am uh, delighted to be on the education committee. I'm delighted to work with all parties on this very important issue. And I look forward to us delivering a scheme which is gonna really suit parents and children because at the end of the day, this is what it's really about. It's about our children and there is no better investment a government can put in in the next generation. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And I should have said that thankfully your first speech was made without interruption, so I um, should have said that at the start. I call on Sinead McLaughlin. Well, Deputy Speaker, and can I take this um, occasion to congratulate you uh, on your position? So I want to start by acknowledging the common feeling across this chamber uh, that the need for a childcare strategy is universally accepted. And so I, while I welcome this debate, the issue here is not the lack of consensus on the question, it's the lack of delivery on the commitment. Um, it is a, a commitment that was first made in, in 2011's programme for government. 13 years later, we are still only at the debating stage uh, and our childcare sector is now in the brink of collapse. We can all clearly see the societal impact of our failure to see childcare as a sustainable uh, part of our infrastructure. 
that helps keep the wheels turning in our workplaces, in our homes and in our schools. We all have constituents who have told us of the pressure that they are under from eye-watering costs, absolutely horrific costs to the home. Indeed, I have no doubt that we are being watched right now by many parents, some of them here uh, in the gallery, who have sat around kitchen tables and had that conversation about whether is it even worth it to stay working at all. And we all know parents that could not make the sums add up and have reluctantly left their jobs. Moreover, we know that it's predominantly women who are locked out of the workforce as a result. Our childcare providers also cannot make those sums add up. They are struggling every single day to keep the lights on. Faced with these truths, everyone should recognise that the status quo of economic self-sabotage is totally untenable. Could the member give away? Yes. Uh, I thank uh, my colleague for giving away. As a father of four, or well, of three young children, I'm well aware of the cost of childcare, but I'm also acutely aware of the value of good childcare. And uh, over the years, we've been blessed uh, with the best. But does the member agree with me that the support needed, both in the short term and in the strategy, must also work for our priceless uh, registered childminders, who are often unacceptably forgotten? Members, an extra minute. Absolutely. Childminders are fundamental to the, the childcare uh, infrastructure. We have over 2,000 registered childminders watching 12,000, in excess of 12,000 of our children, and they are key to um, delivering uh, quality and accessible and flexible childcare. So uh, it is really time to deliver. Yes, let's agree a strategy without delay, but the truth is that a strategy will take time, and that is a time that we simply don't have. So let's recognise the immediacy of this crisis and act, uh, act now. Every day we hear news of more providers shutting their doors and employers struggling to retain and recruit their staff. We all said that this was a day one priority, so let's keep to our word. More than a year ago, the SDLP published proposals to invest in the sector and bring down costs to families. One year on, parents and providers need that support from the executive more than ever. Um, that should include investing in the sector to freeze costs, ensuring that all parents are aware of the support that is available and making a collective approach to the British government to expand access to tax-free childcare. We also need urgent progress on the review of the minimum standards for registered childminders. There is no time to waste, and these solutions are on the table. So today, Minister of Education should walk out of here, pull together the right stakeholders in an advisory group with the voices of parents front and centre and get about the business of delivering support. If we truly prioritise the issue, it will be action, not words, that parents are looking for. Finally, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, there's enormous potential ahead. We know what works and we know what doesn't work. We can look at the failure of the free hours model in England and we can look at the promise of models in countries like Norway and Sweden that uh, invest from a child's first days to transform outcomes and cap costs. Let's stretch our ambition and acknowledge that this is an investment rather than a cost and more importantly, than anything. For once and for all, let's get this done. Here, here. Gwyr Melgut, uh, Sinead, thank you. Sinead, um, as this is Danny Baker's first opportunity to speak as a private member, I would remind the House that it is the Convention that a member's first speech is made without interruption. So, Glam or Danny Baker, I call on Danny Baker. Gwyr Melgut, uh, Deputy Principal Speaker, and Congratulations on your new role. <clears throat> I'm delighted to finally stand in this chamber today to fully represent the people of West Belfast and Callum. Throughout the years, I've been very lucky to have many role models represented the area, like Michael Ferguson, Sue Ramsey, and Jennifer McCann, who all originated from the Callum and who served the community with distinction. As one of four Sinn Féin MLAs in West Belfast, I'm privileged to have the support and guidance of our Leah Eisen Pat and our MP Paul Maskey. I am proud to be from the Collin area and to be their representative is a great honour and I will work tirelessly to be their voice in this assembly. 
I grew up in Twinbrook and attended St Collins High School, a school that built my confidence and inspired me to believe that I could achieve anything if I worked hard. I have to give great credit to the teachers and staff of this amazing school. As one of many who failed their 11 plus, it was that school that, inst that instilled a sense of leadership that gave me the opportunity to stand here today. But St Collins is in the need of a new state-of-the-art school that will serve the needs of the young people of the column. They deserve a new and modern school, and this is something I will continue to raise with the Minister for Education. I have been a community and political activist for as long as I can remember. I first became a political representative in Belfast in 2017, and it was the desire to represent and be the voice of young people within my community that made me want to be an elected representative. Over the last two years, I've been working closely with families who have children with special educational needs, and I listen to the struggles they face every single day. I have to pay tribute to the Colin Autism Group, Sand Space, Kids Together and Shane, who do great work within West Belfast and Lisburn. I will take my role seriously in addressing the systematic failures that these families and children face. It must be a priority that we all work together across all departments in addressing the needs of children with special educational needs and giving long-term solutions that are so desperately required, and to ensure financial resources are given for early intervention. Our youth providers and our community and voluntary sector have been hit hard over the last number of years and, f and faced significant cuts. They go above and beyond to support our young people and our communities in good and difficult times. They need our continuous support. If it wasn't for their commitment to our communities and the most vulnerable in society, we'd be in a far worse situation today. We have one in five children living in poverty in the north, so it is fatal that we deliver an anti-poverty strategy to prevent this staggering figure to continue and address the needs within our communities. During this term, I believe we have an opportunity to make those changes needed to support our special educational needs children and families, our community and voluntary sector, and the most vulnerable in society. Sinn Féin wants a childcare strategy that gives children the best start in life while delivering affordability to their parents. We want to build on the work already taking place to tackle educational underachievement, as well as improving support for children with special educational needs. Children with special educational needs and that of their parents often aren't prioritised. That needs to change. Early intervention is key. Investing in childcare is about investing in people, our economy and the future. Unlike the Tories, we want to drive economic growth, not by poverty, insecurity and fear, but by support, opportunity and progress. Key to delivering a childcare strategy is supporting the sustainability of our providers, whether voluntary, community, private or public sector. The provision of childcare not only underpins women's access to employment, and supports their professional advancement throughout motherhood, the sector itself is the largest employer of women here. We also want a strategy that supports recruitment and retention by improving the terms and conditions of childcare workers, including self-employed childminders, whose role, especially in meeting rural needs, is often overlooked. This motion sets a tone for a new Assembly, and that tone is ambitious. I doubt there is anyone in this chamber who does not support those goals, but key to progressing this is working together. We started that process last week, not just by reinstating power sharing, but also by the unanimous cross-party agreement calling on the British Government to deliver proper funding. Proper funding will play a key role in delivering quality, affordable, accessible and sustainable childcare. And I'm calling for an all-party support on this motion and amendment. Go on, Mary Thank you, Danny. I call upon John from Buckley, please. Thank you. Deputy Speaker, and can I begin by congratulating my friend Cheryl Brown Lee on an amazing maiden speech? I know, looking back, that our late colleague David Hillage would be so proud of the contribution that Cheryl is playing, not only in her role in this house and the seat that he occupied, but also for the fantastic service that she's providing for the constituents of East Antrim. And I wish you every success as you continue to do that. Family life is the heartbeat of Northern Ireland communities, regardless of background. We have always been a region that placed great emphasis and pride on the development and care of our young people. I'm sure if we all look back, we can think of family or community support structures that supported us all in our upbringing. Though we have to admit, societal fluctuations, financial pressures and familiar support structures have not only changed, but in many cases have completely eroded away. 
Working families have faced the blunt end of these changes, something which is having a profound impact on their family life. It's an issue that strikes at the heart of our communities, impacting the lives of working parents, hindering economic growth and perpetuating inequalities. Childcare costs have reached staggering new heights, leaving many families grappling with an impossible choice to work and struggle to afford childcare or to stay at home and sacrifice their careers. The reality is stark. For far too many parents, the cost of childcare outweighs the benefits of returning to work. This is not just a financial burden, it's a barrier to economic participation and advancement. Young families in Portadown, Lurgan and Banbridge have been reaching out to me on this very issue. For some, 40% of all household income can go out on childcare. 40%. Wholly unsustainable. They're concerned that they're being left behind and it's only fair that we right that wrong. The impact of this crisis extends far beyond individual families. It reverberates throughout... Yes, absolutely. I think the, the member for raising that percentage... Uh, Megan is all aware of it, but does it also realise that it's not only the direct cost of childcare, but actually taxation on the family home that is causing co uh, hardships too? I and thank the member, the member, the member the, has an extra member. for the intervention, and he's absolutely right. It, it transfers across so many different aspects of family life. The impact of this crisis extends far beyond individual families. It reverberates throughout our community, our economy stifling productivity and hindering growth. When parents are forced to choose between their jobs and caring for their children, our workforce is deprived of valuable talent and expertise. Businesses lose out on skilled workers and our economy suffers as a result. For many young professional women in Northern Ireland, we proudly trumpeted the smashing of barriers to career opportunities and advancements, and rightly so, only to cruelly pull the rug from under them as they are forced out of employment due to crippling childcare costs. But it doesn't have to be this way. We have the power to enact change, to build a future where every child has access to quality, affordable childcare, and every par parent has the opportunity to pursue their career without sacrificing their family's well-being. That's why I'm calling for free funded childcare provision in Northern Ireland. It's time for us to invest in our families, to prioritise the well-being of our children and to support working parents in their pursuit of economic security. By providing affordable childcare, we can alleviate the financial strain on families, empowering parents to re-enter the workforce or advance in their careers, and stimulate economic growth through, in through increased productivity and participation. But beyond the economic benefits, Principal Deputy Speaker, investing in childcare is an investment in our future. It's an investment in the next generation, ensuring that every child has the opportunity not only to thrive, to learn, but to reach their full potential. I know this minister gets this issue. I know he cares and is focused on delivery. Though he simply cannot do this on his own. It falls across so many departments. Yes, he can, and I know he will lead on a childcare strategy. But I will watch with interest how the cross-departmental involvement comes when hard financial realities hit in. In conclusion, Principal Deputy Speaker, let us stand together and demand free, affordable, funded childcare provision in Northern Ireland. Let us build a future where no family is burdened by the exorbitant costs of childcare and every child has the right to flourish. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Nick Matheson is our next speaker, and since this is Nick's first opportunity to speak as a private member, I would remind the House that it is a convention that a member's first speech is made without interruption.
Nick Matheson. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, it is an honour and a privilege uh, to have the opportunity to give my maiden speech today uh, as one of the two Alliance members for Strangford. Uh, and I want to say from the outset that I am committed to representing everyone in the constituency where I grew up uh, and where I am bringing up my family today. Uh, it truly is uh, a great privilege. I also want to take the opportunity to pay tribute to my predecessor in the, in the seat, Lord Weir. Uh, Lord Weir served the constituencies of North Down and Strangford with distinction since 1998, as well as holding the Office of Education Minister on two separate occasions. I am aware that as the new chair of the Education Committee that the issue of childcare will be high on the committee's agenda, but I think as the committee has yet to meet, yet I should limit my comments as chair uh, as to say no more than that I hope and trust uh, all members on that committee will seek to work together to support the delivery uh, of the much-needed childcare strategy. So I will be speaking today uh, to support the motion as amended. Uh, uh, and I, I think the amendment you know, does add s some additional uh, considerations around the need for wider consultation, so happy to support that. Childcare is indeed in a state of crisis, and that has been set out very clearly by every member who has spoken. And tackling the affordability element of that is vital. Northern Ireland needs a bespoke scheme uh, that invests both in the childcare sector uh, to make it sustainable, and also requires that in return for that investment that costs come down. But I want to be very clear today on my contributions because I think the issue of cost will be covered in detail, and that is quite right. But I want to be very clear that for me and for our party, childcare is very much a part of a wider early education system, and that quality, affordable childcare can have a significant and positive impact on our children that goes far beyond just the issue of improving access to work for parents, as important as that is. So, Principal Deputy Speaker, you'll be aware of the importance of the first 1,000 days in a child's life. So many of the factors that influence a child's health, development, well-being and life chances are best impacted through policy intervention at that stage. So, by ensuring that we have a child-centred, affordable and high-quality early years and childcare system, we can positively shape the future life chances of children and young people. So I'm pleased that the, that the motion makes very clear reference to special educational needs and ensuring that support for children with additional needs uh, are, are well provided for in any, in any child care strategy. And we know that parents and guardians of children with additional needs are much less likely to use child care and report significant and substantial struggles in, in, in actually accessing child care that is appropriate for their children's needs. The recent RSM report detailing, I think, 46% uh, of parents of children with complex needs uh, detailed clear challenges in getting access to those places. So our future childcare strategy must be based around an understanding of the factors that are specific to children with additional needs, including the need to ensure that settings are qualified and confident to meet those children's needs effectively. And I think it is also vitally important that child care has a, to, to acknowledge that childcare has a key role in tackling poverty. We must invest in settings that wrap support around families to safeguard children and to address the needs of the most vulnerable families in society. And I want to, to, to pay tribute to the work of the Community Daycare Network uh, and thank them for their extensive uh, engagement with the All Party Group and with us as a party. I've learned so much from them about the important role that childcare settings, particularly those at the heart of some of our most disadvantaged communities, will play in the lives not just of the children in their care, but their wider families. So we must ensure in any uh, childcare strategy that is brought forward uh, that these settings are supported and that the development of our early learning and childcare strategy is viewed through a very clear anti-poverty lens. So, Principal Deputy Speaker, although we lag far behind our counterparts across the UK, Ireland and Europe in this issue, we have a chance to get childcare provision right. We know that the 33 hours model is not working and I would urge the Minister to look at options as widely as he can across the board. Without the required workforce strategy and investment, simply creating demand without addressing supply will not deliver. What we need in Northern Ireland is provision that is inclusive and accessible to all children. Alliance has been raising the need to address child care provision for many, many years, and I want to pay tribute to, to former member Chris Little, who, who has been doing that since as far back as 2010 uh, and really did blaze a trail in that regard. But regrettably, ministers directly responsible for delivering on a strategy have failed to do so. So now must be the time to deliver. Parents and children in Northern Ireland expect and deserve nothing less from this Assembly.
Thank you. Um, Nick, I now call on Paul Frew, please. Mr. Prince, or Ms. Principal, Deputy Speaker, um, I could call you something else you were promoted to last week, but I'll not. Uh, congratulate you on your post. Um, and can I also congratulate all those who have made their maiden speech in this place today? It's not easy, uh, and it's on a very big subject. So, congratulations to you all, not least my colleague here from East Antrim, but also to uh, Nick Matheson, who also. Uh, mentioned Lord Weir and his contribution to this place and we are very uh, appreciative of that so thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, the family is the brick of society and if there's one thing this assembly and this executive which is a different place can do is support and build on those bricks. Raising children is the greatest privilege of all. But it's not easy. So government must do everything they can to make sure that families get as much support as they can give away from the family setting. And if there is a message that can go out of this place today to send a clear signal to those hard-pressed mums and dads is that one, we listen, and that two, we're driven to action. And in so many times, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have always said we've listened, but we've never acted. So let's hope that things will change in this place. Yes, I will, yeah. Member for Given Way, and I really. I'm enjoying his passion and with regard to the, the direction he's taken this. I'm just minded to think that you started off really strongly on the, on the family. But there is a you know, families are slightly different in terms of their makeup than they ever were, and we have a grown number of single parent families, and those single parents find it even more difficult when there's only one income coming in. So in terms of the development of this policy, it's, it's the opportunity, I hoped, in, in the co-design. Would he agree with me that there needs to be that ambition to factor that in, that it's not, you know, it's not just the nuclear two plus one family, but single parents in particular, perhaps, to offer them a hope of a route back into uh, uh, work and, and earnings? And the member's an extra minute. Thank you. And, and yes, I thank the member for his contribution, because he's quite right, single parents. But, but it's not that you're just a single person because you will have a family. But I fear for those single parents that the family come under massive pressure. So it's, it's not just that single parent, it's the whole family that can struggle with, with, with childcare. And, and so he's absolutely right that these things should be tailored to suit the most vulnerable in our societies. And so I absolutely agree with him. And, of course, we have made strides in this regard. In September 22, my colleague and then Education Minister Michelle McAveen announced the first steps towards this commitment, having instructed her officials to develop a timetable and cost of delivery plan to provide a minimum of 22 and a half hours. Now, we know that's not enough, but what that did was bed it into the psyche of the department so that we won't go in reverse. And it's critically important that we move on and advance those arguments and advance these policies. But we also need to ensure, and I'm glad, I'm so glad that this is the first day of real debate. It's the first day that parties, namely Sinn Féin, can choose a debate. And I'm so glad that they've chosen this one. So credit where credit is due. And I'm so glad that we have been able to, to debate these issues. But it is vital that the executive works together to deliver this because out of this policy will so much more flow that will help other sectors and other departments. Economy, infrastructure, all of those places where it's workforce intensive, those places will benefit if we get this right. So it's not just supporting the family, it's supporting the infrastructure around the support for government that we need. And if we go about producing a program for government, which we haven't really talked about yet, we should see this wetted right through it so that every single department can pick up the burden and carry it. 
And that's what I would like to see as an MLA, as a member of this assembly. I would like to see the executive pick this up and support families the way they should. This executive shouldn't hurt families the way they have over the past two years or the two years before. Let's try to get policies that actually support families instead of hurting them. And so I look forward to that day. But this will all come at a cost. So it's vitally important that the, exec the, the, the executive knows the full cost. So maybe when the minister is addressing this debate, he could raise the issue with regards to how much this will actually cost so that we can get this programmed into the psyche of the executive before anything else. Because there are other burdens. There are other, other pressures. But I believe this is one of the greatest burdens that our people face nowadays. Not only for childcare, young families trying to keep down a home, young families trying to hold on to not one job, but two jobs in many cases. Members, time's up. And it's vitally important that we listen and we act. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and since, sorry, it's Sasha Eastwood's um, first opportunity to speak as a private member, I would remind the House that it is convention that anyone making their first speech is made without interruption. I call on Sasha Eastwood. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I acknowledge that this is my maiden speech, and I am humbled and privileged to take my place in this chamber to serve the people of Lagan Valley. I also want to acknowledge the person that previously held this seat, my former colleague Trevor Lawton, who served his constituents with distinction, and I pay my thanks to him. I also want to thank the Lagan Valley Alliance Association, without whom none of this would be possible, my family, and lastly, my husband Dale. Lagan Valley is my home where my family have had their roots for hundreds of years and still live on our small farm in Blairis, County Down, where my mum, Bridget, was born, a place I love and will always love. The name Lisburn or Lisnagarawa means Fort of the Gamblers, but gambling is what we've done too much of lately. Gambling people's lives on high-stakes games of politics. Principal Deputy Speaker, we need to reform these institutions so that no one party can again hold us to ransom. I was 12 when the Good Friday Agreement was signed, and my generation was promised the best. We were promised more than just the absence of violence, but we were promised the economic and social benefits of peace. Peace comes dropping slow, as they say, but the economic and social policies we need to allow this generation and the one behind to achieve their full potential are severely lacking. But I promise you, Principal Deputy Speaker, my generation will not leave the hard work behind for the ones coming after. This generation will finish it and make good on what we were all promised. If a peace process takes 50 years, then we are about halfway. And that is more than past time to move beyond what sometimes passes for politics here. Indeed, we can be quite good at it when this place and its people aren't being used as leverage. But the people can't wait anymore. We must stop exporting our best assets, our people, away from these shores. And indeed, addressing the issue of childcare will be key in meeting that aim. I believe our best days are yet to come, and together we can create them. We are no longer painting in just monochrome, but we have a wide and varied, beautiful palette of colour. We must have that vision and belief to give people hope and a future, to convince them that we can make their lives better not just by words, but with deeds, and rebuild trust and faith in these institutions. Within a mile of my home in Lycan Valley, there are Egyptian societies, women's resource centres, Gaelic pitches, chess clubs, orange halls, young farmers clubs, an LGBT safe space club. This is the new Northern Ireland, the North, our home, your home. This land, this island, the home of saints and scholars, of Harry Ferguson and Jocelyn Bell Burnell, has punched well above our weight on the world stage. And despite all our challenges, we still have incredible inventors and makers. But there are many more like them waiting to be discovered. But they do not have adequate childcare or are bankrupting themselves to pay for it. Principal Deputy Speaker, our challenge is to create together the ecosystem, the society to allow those makers to flourish, not despite of us, but because of us. Indeed, if the signature of this mandate can be anything, let it be empowering people, not simply holding them back. 
However, childcare is one issue holding many people, particularly women, back. It takes a village, but the situation for many parents now is at breaking point. Even as I speak, families in Ligon Valley are reeling from the closure of a local childcare provider. Things are not tenable as they are, and we cannot let slip further on our watch. A progressive childcare policy is a key economic driver. We know Northern Ireland has a low productivity rate and yet high economic inactivity. We know that many parents are being forced from working due to exorbitant childcare costs, and this is having a hugely adverse impact on our workforce. And while we talk about empowering parents to fulfil their ambitions, let's also talk about the childcare workforce. Childcare is a highly skilled profession and one that demands a lot more of society's respect. The childcare profession is full of people that want to develop and we need to support them to do that. That is why Alliance believes a key element of childcare policy should be the introduction of a clear skills and qualification framework. In conclusion, this policy will require a significant investment and we shouldn't shy away from that. Quality care should require significant investment. Our children deserve that investment. And while this will be costly, it will cost us more to do nothing. I support the motion today, and I look forward to working with the whole House on these issues in the years to come. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Sorsha. Um, I now call, on, call upon Diane Dodds. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, and thank you again to all those um, who have made their maiden speech today. It's not an easy thing to do in this house. Um, and this is essentially one of the, the, the most worthwhile, I think, um, areas where those maiden speeches could have been made. Um, I want to acknowledge as vice chair of the all party group on early education and childcare, the work that has gone into um, the debate uh, on this uh, and to the many organisations um, that we've met with um, over the last um, period of time. Um, it is indeed a testament to that that we have as a first uh, motion in the Assembly uh, on the first full day of business that we are actually debating uh, this issue and I do want to pay tribute to them, many of whom are in the gallery today. Um, I think we all agree um, in this House that there is a need for a long-term strategy for childcare in Northern Ireland. Um, and there has been many fine words in this chamber today, and that's all to the good. But the harsh reality will be that we will need a fully costed strategy for childcare. Um, and that fully costed strategy will require the mature cooperation right across the executive. It will require the Minister of Health in terms of minimum standards. It will require the cooperation of the Minister for Finance in terms of providing the means to do that. And it will, of course, require the work and dedication of the Minister in Education to bring forward that strategy for the Executive. So there is a huge challenge in this uh, today. Yes, of course I will. And I, and I hope this is a, a useful intervention. Just one of other minister, perhaps that there's possibly two other ministers that could be included in this because we're, we're talking about expanding on opportunities in terms of employability. So the, the minister for the economy, but also for those economically inactive, um, the minister for communities, I would suggest has a role to play here. And. I accept that this is going to be a costly solution in the longer term. So in the short term, there's something we can definitely do in and around, I think, the, the three to four year olds and possibly two to three year olds. But for that longer term ambition, if we have that, that full executive um, proportionality, perhaps that's where we, we leverage the finances from. And the member has an extra minute. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I, I absolutely agree with the member, and, and in citing the, member, the, the different ministers, I don't mean to be exclusive in terms of those ministers, but to demonstrate to the House that this is a matter for the whole executive, not just for the Minister for Education, and he will need the support of the whole executive in actually bringing forward a strategy that is reasonable, feasible, and uh, fully costed and affordable. So. Um, I, I, if you allow me to progress just for a minute, and I, I certainly will. Um, <clears throat> so I want to 
look at this in a, in a couple of ways. So the first is that intervention and sustainability that is required for the childcare sector. Um, and we've heard about um, childcare businesses that have had to close. Um, and we need a sector that isn't always on the edge and teetering on the brink as it has currently been over the past number uh, of years. And that will require not just sustainability, it requires training and proper pay for staff. And that is massively important as we go forward. It also needs us to recognise as a society that childcare is not, as uh, the member for South Belfast said, about babysitting. Childcare is about the development of our children. It is about looking after them in a setting where their potential can be reached. It is about support for families and it is about support for the economy. So these are all really, really important issues. And again, I'm delighted that in this house today we have acknowledged the need for provision for childcare for parents who have children with special educational needs. Um, my colleague from North Antrim um, referenced the fact that the previous Minister um, in Education had looked at uh, the DUP policy, which was to try to provide 30 uh, hours of childcare for children um, aged 3 to 4. Now, we know that that's not enough, and we know that we need to do more, but a strategy takes many, many years to put in place. And I think that there are some quick wins that we can have within that strategy in the here and now. And one of those is to try to get to a position where we have 22 and a half hours of early um, education for three to four year olds in Northern Ireland and that that is guaranteed. And that we make up the 30 hours by some kind of voucher scheme for parents who could perhaps use that or save it as, as they want. And I will be keen to hear the Minister's view on this. I also think that we can do much more in terms of our schools. So wraparound care in school tends to vary extremely, um, like, it's, it's like, I don't know, across Northern Ireland. So you can have places where there are schools that have five days a week of wraparound care for children, where children can go from eight in the morning to, to later on in the afternoon to zero. Um, and I do think that we can actually, by investing in our schools, also provide part of the solution to this problem. So Thank you, Principal Deputy up. Speaker. Yeah. I realise that I've outrun my time, but I do think that this is a matter of huge importance, and I would like to hear of some of the things that we can do that are quick wins in order to bring about solutions to the problem. Thank you. I call on Cara Hunter, please. You, uh, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Principal Deputy Speaker, um, and I'd also like to congratulate you uh, on your recent appointment and also to colleagues across this House on their maiden speech. Uh, it's both a nerve-wracking and an exciting time for you all, I'd imagine, so congratulations to you all. Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak today in what is the first speech I've had in two years, and what better issue to begin with th uh, than the issue of affordable and accessible childcare and the need for uh, a childcare strategy. This is a matter of immense importance uh, to the families and the future prospects of this place which we call home. The current lack of affordable childcare has significant negative effects on families in my constituency and I'd also like to express uh, gratitude for the parents across my own constituency but also uh, melted parents and I who have shared their experiences highlighting both the mental uh, and financial stress that is truly caused um, by the lack uh, of an effective childcare strategy here. The cost of Northern Ireland without a comprehensive strategy is staggering and we know that the average cost of uh, full-time childcare with two children uh, reaches nearly uh, 25,000 a year. It's just undoable and it forces so many into this space where you're having the conversation of uh, affording childcare or uh, having a career and no one and no woman uh, should be forced into this um, due to a lack of a strategy. This is a dilemma that remains a day and daily reality for parents in 2024, placing immense pressure on finances and families. In my constituency, I've witnessed firsthand the burden that this causes parents and childcare providers. 
I have seen how rising costs and overheads have compelled providers, particularly in rural areas, to increase fees. This puts providers in a difficult and, frankly, unfair position. It also impacts their ability to both recruit and retain staff. And for so many staff, they really genuinely love working in this sector. And I echo uh, the sentiment and the statements from previous speakers around childcare is so much more than babysitting. Um, it's about the development of our young people, and therefore it's absolutely necessary um, that this strategy is put in place. Um, I, I can't talk about this issue without referring, of course, um, to special educational needs. And I know the Minister will share my concerns um, regarding challenges uh, in this area. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, in the last two years, uh, I have spoken with so many parents uh, who have touched on the impact uh, of a lack of support services with, with children who have uh, special educational needs. And in my own constituency, there's the Harpers Hill uh, Children and Family Centre, and they've really touched on. I've spoken with parents there and staff there about um, just the role that they have in those early years and being the first intervention. Sometimes being the first people that recognise maybe someone has a special educational need advising parents on where they can find support um, and how to go about getting an assessment. Um, so really, those young, uh, for those young kids and those crucial skills, um, that's why these uh, childcare providers are just so important. Um, and children today and tomorrow shouldn't pay the price uh, with this chronic underfunding that we've seen in our childcare facilities. Um, I know that we've had years previous, we've had the pandemic, we've had the energy crisis, and we all know that that's only intensified uh, challenges in this area. We know that unaffordable childcare impacts parents, but specifically it has an impact on women and that cannot be overstated. Thousands are forced to stay at home due to the uh, rising childcare costs here, hindering their professional growth and also limiting their contributions to society. The economic setback for women goes far beyond finances as it's a huge barrier to their potential. And I welcome the shared agreement here today across this House. Although I'm not a parent, um, I recognise wholeheartedly just the impact that these costs do have. And as Mr Butler has touched on earlier, just these rising costs as well and the pressure to put petrol in your car, to pay your electric bill, it really does all add up. Now, in the SDLP, uh, we had floored uh, our amendment to the motion, um, which we were hoping to get a report back from the Minister in the first 100 days, and sadly that wasn't accepted. But as we push forward, we want to see a child uh, care strategy shaped for and uh, shaped by parents here in the North. The time for solutions is now, and we cannot let the lack of affordable child care hinder the potential of our families and our economy any longer. Thank you. is Nulam Callister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I'm rising today to focus on a number of issues that some people across the chamber um, have raised, but I'm very conscious that as I, I do this, I remember back to when I first started working at the Assembly back in 2011, and one of the first things that I actually heard in this Assembly chamber was Chris Little, MLA at the time, asked the Minister of Education a question during oral questions around a childcare strategy. So it's really frustrating to think that here we are 14, 13 years later and we're still no further. Some of the issues that I want to focus on today are particularly around the issue of childcare which starts at birth and the reason why I say about it starting at birth is because we need to think about maternity, paternity and adoption leave provision. When we have many parents that are almost after three months are into quite low incomes because they're on maternity, paternity or adoption leave then to go back into work or immediately thrust into these high prices of childcare, it just doesn't stack up. So before you've even given birth, before you've even adopted and had your new child, you're already thinking, what am I going to do? Do I return to work or not? Now, we are where we are because of the patriarchy. Let's face it. Society has been designed for hundreds of years for men going to work and women staying at home. But it's not like that anymore. We know that families have changed. We know more women are in the workplace. We know that families consist of one mum or one dad, two dads or two mums. Families are all different, and that's why we need to have a childcare strategy implemented that suits the needs of every single family and every single child. I want to speak a little bit about school-aged children. When we speak about childcare, we often focus on the not to four age group, but actually it's those school-aged children that can sometimes be forgotten about. Um, I am conscious right now as I speak that just before the debate, I myself was only trying to sort out childcare for my own two children. Daycare closes at six. We're not going to rise potentially until after six. And like many parents across Northern Ireland, whether they're working in hospitals, whether they're working in schools, they just don't have that flexibility of childcare. 
and then comes in the grandparents. We all rely on our parents, on children's grandparents to actually pick it up, but not everybody has that flexibility, not everybody has that support, and that's why it falls on us here in the Assembly and the Minister to actually help those families. But wraparound care is key. I implore the Minister here today, I know that there's a lot of talk, particularly from the DUP benches, about focusing on that standardisation on three to four year olds. But I want to be clear, and the sector has been clear, preschool provision isn't childcare. It's not childcare. If we want to standardise the preschool hours, and we absolutely should, we should standardise preschool hours, but we can't expect parents to then top up with vouchers for the extra to make it to 30, because what childcare setting is going to take it for an extra day, one day, an extra, or an extra hour one day, two hours another day? It, it simply doesn't work. We really need that bespoke reality here for Northern Ireland. So I would implore the Minister that whilst it might be a quick win, it's not going to work for the majority of parents. We need to standardise preschool day and we need to have childcare on top of that. We need to ensure that no matter what we do going forward, that it's fixed permanently. And I think that may be where we may have delay in implementing this, but we want to get it right. We want to make sure that whatever we do for parents, it means that more parents, especially women, can go back into the workforce and that when their child turns four and is in school, they now still have that childcare to rely upon, that they don't have to think, what do I do now? Let's pay for the after schools clubs, let's send them swimming, let's send them to football, racking up the costs there because it can't be done anywhere else. So we need to think about it from birth right up until the point where your child is allowed to and should be able to stay at home alone, because we all know that for every child it is different. But I would implore the Minister that when we are going to implement this child care strategy, and, and I hope that we, we do see it coming soon, that we think about it in a holistic view, well, that it's not... Way. Yep, yep. Thank you, uh, Member, for giving way, and I agree with your points about the long-term view. Would you also agree that the crisis is now, and so while we need a long-term strategy, we also need immediate interventions, such as pushing for increase in tax-free child credit, um, such as convening a, a, a task force, and potentially a COVID-style pavement, which could support uh, providers so that they could offset the costs on parents' fees? Absolutely. And I, I members, do an extra minute. I do agree, and I thank my um, colleague for raising the issue. And I think it would um, go a long way um, if this assembly, particularly behind the Minister of Education, um, did call for that raise in the tax-free allowance. We know it goes somewhat in helping, but but it's simply not enough. Um, but look, I have said everything that I think needs to say, particularly around ensuring that we have that proper bespoke um, childcare strategy here. Let's not dupe parents. Let's actually fix the system ensure that we get it right from day one. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Nuna, I have one more speaker. I'm trying to get everybody who's requested to speak on the list. So, Jerry, it's yourself. I just want to remind you that if you take any interventions, you won't have extra time. Jerry Carl. Thanks, Deputy Speaker, and thanks, Beth. Um, I want to thank the, the parents, obviously, guardians, childcare workers and campaigners who have forced the issue of an unaffordable childcare on the Storms agenda, and some I think are here today, obviously, after years of government uh, inaction. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, can't be emphasised enough that childcare costs are too high. They were too high before Stormont's collapse, too high before the cost of living crisis, and it's high time that politicians and the executive do something about it. In socially deprived communities, deputy speaker like mine, which have suffered years of attacks from Stormont and Westminster, we have stagnant wages, welfare reform and service cuts, to name, to name a few, and childcare costs are pushing people to the to breaking point, to the brink. And there is no worse indictment of the current economic system and the fact that many uh, working people are forced to pay for childcare, that a commodity has been made of the nurture, care and development of future generations. It is shameful that while families pay out a huge bulk of their wages in childcare costs, some can make a fortune doing something that should be a basic publicly funded social necessity. And I agree with a lot of the motion and I'll be supporting it today um, that we need to tackle unaffordable childcare costs. I think some of the content um, should uh, cause further uh, debate and teasing out. I think it's worth noting that uh, some of the motion is written with economic growth or the market uh, in mind uh, rather than the families uh, front and centre. I think we need to move away from being fixated with childcare being seen as an issue about solely or primarily driving the local economy, rather than improving 
uh, people's uh, families' lives and improving overall living standards for, for everybody. And sometimes there's a, uh, a focus overtly on getting people back to work, whether they want to go work, back to work or not. Uh, and while it's true that many people uh, do want to return to work and should be afforded the opportunity to do so, many more are in fact forced to return to work just to pay bills. And this motion obviously doesn't acknowledge uh, the child care provided by parents and guardians at home is in fact labour, is in fact work, as some have sort of referred to uh, in their speeches. Raising children is an unpaid job that it overwhelmingly falls on women to do so, and I believe that those who choose to do it at home should be paid to do that job, a difficult job, as people have uh, mentioned. That said, um, Deputy Speaker, whilst we may differ in our reasoning and tease out some of those issues, uh, we believe that affordable childcare is a worthwhile and important aspiration, and we'll be supporting the motion today. But we think we can go further. Further. We think that childcare, um, like healthcare or any other form of care, should be free at the point of service. We think that there is enough wealth in our society to provide universal free childcare that is paid through progressive taxation. We think the conversation about childcare has to put our children's development, workers' welfare, and families at its core, and must remove the profit mo motive motive from its provision, the state must step in to support community-run not-for-profit facilities in the crucial work they do. The state also must plan a deputy speaker for the provision of publicly owned childcare facilities where workers are given decent pay and terms uh, to match the invaluable nature of their roles. And it is just quite shocking that in this building there's still no childcare crash facilities for not just MLAs but all the staff that work in and around this building who have children. Uh, I believe it is absolutely shocking and it beggars belief. In a nutshell, uh, we must uh, take childcare provision out of the hands of the wealthy private entities and ensure that we all as a society provide childcare for people, not for profit. Thank you. Jerry, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to call on the Minister of Education. The Minister, you have 15 minutes to respond to the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I wish you well in uh, your due duties. Um, can I thank Assembly colleagues for bringing this motion forward for discussion? I also want to thank members who contributed to the important debate, and I welcome the opportunity to respond. Can I pay tribute to those members, of which I think uh, there were five, if not six, who gave their maiden speech, and I have to say you very much will be adding to the abilities within this uh, chamber um, in terms of the content and the ability to articulate that message was uh, mightily impressive. Uh, forgive me for singling out my colleague uh, Cheryl Brownlee for her contribution, and uh, I'm delighted that she was able to uh, come into this assembly representing East Antrim. Um, she is very much a worthy successor of uh, our late good friend, uh, David Hildage, who she rightly paid tribute to, and I associate myself uh, with her remarks. Uh, can I uh, assure uh, the House that the development of an early learning and childcare strategy is a top priority for me as Education Minister? There is no time to waste, and I will be bringing an initial paper on this issue to my executive colleagues later this week. It is clear that we have much work to do, and I am determined to press ahead at pace. Turning to the current position, let me first stress that this is about both early learning and childcare. This strategy will have dual aims supporting child development and enabling parental employment. It is about giving children the best start in life and supporting working families. It is important that the work we do and the model we put in place is capable of achieving both. I am aware that the cost of childcare is putting immense strain on family finances and in some cases is preventing parents, particularly women, from entering and remaining in the workforce and progressing in their careers after they have children. Childcare, rather than being a barrier, should be a key enabler for parents to progress in the workplace and to access training and development opportunities. Now, while making childcare more affordable for working families is a core objective for me and the executive, it will be the willingness of the executive to fund it that will be the real test of commitment. Did the minister give way? I will. I thank the minister uh, for her education uh, for giving way, and look, I thank everybody for bringing and speaking on this motion today. But would the minister agree with me that look, the executive has been engaged in this for some considerable time? Bright start the strategic direction back in 2013 
with 15 key actions. But the one big challenge that was faced was the uh, collective pulling together to prioritise resources and funds required for this. We know that this will require significant investment, but I know that everyone, and what I'm hearing is that everyone recognises that without this investment by the executive, this simply will not work, it will not be funded. Um, but in addition to a well-funded, well-designed strategy, which is much needed, there is also the need for urgent actions. I'm glad that this was on the executive agenda for the first meeting last week, and you've indicated we will have a discussion with a paper this week. Can the minister confirm uh, that urgent actions will also be required and he will be bringing some of those immediate actions to support parents in crisis at the minute and settings, childcare settings, that are really struggling as well. The Minister doesn't have extra time. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I concur with uh, the Deputy First Minister in the remarks um, that she has made. And I am pleased that um, both uh, the Deputy First Minister and the First Minister uh, outlined this as being a priority. It was one of the uh, five issues that were on the agenda for our first executive meeting. Um, I'm bringing forward a paper for discussion uh, this Thursday to executive colleagues. Uh, and that will also touch upon some of the issues that members raised about departmental uh, buy-in to this process, and, and a number of departments have been named in that. And it will be critical uh, that that uh, cross-departmental approach is taken um, forward in collaboration. I will lead on it, uh, but it will need the buy-in of other executive departments and it will need uh, the executive as a whole uh, to make this a, a key priority for us to deliver. So, As well as considering affordability measures for working parents, I want to ensure that we support well-established and highly effective early years programmes such as Sure Start. These interventions support children facing disadvantage who are at greatest risk of poor educational outcomes. I'll for, forgive me, I have a lot to get through, so I'm going to make some progress, and if I have time, I will. Uh, we will need a package of targeted measures aimed at addressing the various outcomes we want to achieve and which members have all raised. I'm very well aware of the challenges which many parts of the early learning and childcare sector are facing in terms of their sustainability and difficulty in recruiting and retaining staff. And I look forward to meeting parents, early learning and childcare providers for other stakeholders over the coming weeks to hear from them firsthand what they feel needs to be done. Some members mentioned a, an advisory group. There is a stakeholder uh, engagement forum which already exists and that is something that I can look to in terms of expanding and repurposing as we um, move forward in delivering this childcare strategy. Our first priority will be to stabilise and further develop these services as we seek to address issues of underinvestment. The work to date has involved extensive stakeholder engagement, both through the establishment of a stakeholder engagement forum and in individual stakeholder meetings. My officials have also had engagement with government officials across the United Kingdom and in the Republic of Ireland to learn about their early learning and childcare schemes, what their objectives are, how they were developed and implemented, and what outcomes they are delivering. While we can and should learn from others, it is important that we consider what would be best for Northern Ireland and deliver the outcomes we want to achieve here. I am aware of the reported implementation issues in rolling out the 30-hour offer in England, and we want to learn from that. However, at this stage, I do not want to rule out any options until I have had the opportunity to consider them in more detail and see if there are elements of them which might translate into the Northern Ireland context. I want to deliver a bespoke affordability scheme for Northern Ireland, one which addresses the challenges we face and delivers the outcomes that we want to achieve. However, it must also align with the financial support already provided by the government to assist with childcare costs, principally through universal credit and the tax-free child care scheme. It would be important not to displace these inadvertently. And I am aware that there have been calls to ask the government to increase its contribution to the tax-free childcare scheme upwards of the current 20% contribution. Um, Ms McAllister and uh, Ms Nicholl alluded to that particular issue. And I share the desire to see this government contribution increased. Indeed, my party colleague and predecessor in post, Michelle McIlveen, wrote to the Chancellor of the Exchequer in September of 2022, requesting an uplift in this contribution from 20% to 30% and to remove the cap on the total amount that can be claimed by parents in any one year. Members of Parliament from Great Britain have also made similar calls. So far, however, His Majesty's Treasurer has not agreed to any increase. However, I intend to continue to pursue this 
as it would undoubtedly provide additional support for working families relatively quickly. In advance of expansion, I fully recognise the need to stabilise existing core services and programmes in order to create a firm foundation for growth. There are already some well-established and high-quality government-funded early learning and childcare services to build upon. These include my department's preschool education programme, Sure Start, the Pathway Fund and the Toy Box Project. And Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, I want to pay tribute to programmes like Sure Start and Pathway and those who deliver them. Studies consistently show that such early interventions improve children's cognitive abilities and social and emotional skills, leading to greater academic achievement. These benefits have been shown to extend to wider society through improved health, lower crime rates and increased productivity. I know the staff working in these programmes have a passion for what they do, and they make a real and lasting difference in the lives of many children and families, and I pay tribute to them today. While funded preschool is universally available in Northern Ireland, the preschool offer varies between 12 and a half hours per week and 22 and a half hours per week for a 38-week uh, slot in the year. Therefore, while the offer is universal, the session lengths are not. Approximately just 40% of children currently receive 22 and a half hours, while 60% are receiving a minimum of 12 and a half hours. We need to address this inequity as a priority and begin to move to a position where all children receive 22 and a half hours per week. This would contribute to both our child development and child care objectives. It would also result in Northern Ireland having a higher level of universal provision for three to four year olds than England, which we are often compared to. In England, three to four year old children whose parents are not in employment only get 15 hours. Even so, 22 and a half hours is not the height of our ambition for working families with children of this age. We have a manifesto commitment to provide 30 hours, and that remains my objective. Following significant engagement with the sector and findings from independent Commission reviews, it is clear there is a real and urgent need to protect our current provision and reinvest in areas which have been squeezed by rising costs and constrained funding. I will want to do this as a matter of urgency. There are other issues to be addressed too, not least making sure appropriate childcare is available and accessible for children with disabilities and special educational needs. It is also important that I consider the recommendations made by the expert panel in the Fair Start report and, more recently, the independent review of education on this issue. We all agree that the current level of early learning and childcare support available to children and parents in Northern Ireland uh, is inadequate, and there is a need for the Executive to address this. Implementing an ambitious programme of reform will take time, which is why I also want to consider what short-term measures might be possible to ease current uh, pressures. The budget needed for all of this will be significant and require an ongoing commitment. If real and meaningful change is to happen, executive colleagues must be willing to properly invest in early learning and childcare. And members have asked for costings in association with this. However, can I just say, when fully implemented, the annual and recurring costs could potentially be up to £400 million. The ultimate scale of the budget required will be dependent on the scope of the strategy and the level of support agreed by the Executive across the range of areas proposed. However, make no mistake about my ambition for this strategy and my commitment to make the case for the funding required to, to deliver progress as a matter of urgency. Members may ask, as I did, how was the 400 million figure arrived at? And I'm told it is a relatively conservative estimate. Members, to standardise our preschool education placements, so all children get 22 and a half hours, 35 million pounds. Actions supporting Sure Start, Pathway and Toy Box towards full expansion, £40 million. Pounds. Actions to support sector sustainability, workforce development, children with additional needs, £50 million. Pounds. Funding model to support affordability of childcare, 
which Ms McAllister talked about, to go beyond three to four years, if that was applied to from nine months old to age four, estimated cost based on 30 hours of funding childcare, £270 million. That gives us the total of £400 million. This is a figure through engaging with stakeholders, but also through the Strategic Investment Board's own assessment has been arrived at. So, members, that figure is hugely significant. So I welcome the commitment from the First Minister, the Deputy First Minister and all of the political parties that this is a top priority for us to deliver. I will drive forward this uh, childcare strategy, but members be under no illusion as to the scale of the funding that will be needed to make this a reality. Of course, it will take time to have the childcare strategy fully developed and rolling out, but that is the quantum of the resources that could be needed uh, to deliver a fully costed and uh, childcare strategy. So I do invite the House to support me in this, and I want to thank members for their contribution to the discussion. I welcome the further engagement with all concerned, so that the benefits of a new early learning and childcare strategy are fully realised. I commend this to the House. Thank you, Minister. And just uh, this is my first opportunity to put in the record um, my condolences on the loss of David Hildage. But far Jasse, he was a lovely man, sat in the call committee with him. So condolences. Um, Mike Nesbitt is next to wind on the amendment and make you five minutes. Principal Deputy Speaker, thank you very much. And may I congratulate you and wish you well and hope you enjoy the view. Uh, may I also congratulate all those who made their maiden speeches, Cheryl Brownlee, Kate Nicholl, Danny Baker, Nick Matheson and Sosh Eastwood. Thanks also to my colleague Mr Butler for the amendment uh, and to Ms Mason, Ms Brogan, Mr Baker and Ms Kimmins for the motion, at which point, Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm getting sick of being nice to people and I'm going to pick a fight. And the fight I choose to pick with is with Mr Butler, who opened his remarks by bemoaning the fact that he and others have been at this for two years. I feel I've been at this for over 12 years. May I remind the House that until May of 2016, this issue fell within the remit of the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. Uh, and I chaired several meetings of the Scrutiny Committee and when we tried to understand where the blockage was in bringing forward a strategy, not least because it had a budget line. Uh, from memory, there was £12 million uh, for, for childcare, which for a long time sat uh, unspent. So I think this is an opportunity to get it right this time. And I do believe it's not just about affordable childcare, it's about affordable and accessible. And I will give way. Um, and I just want to highlight again that there actually was an executive strategic direction that was agreed by the executive called Bright Start. There were 15 key actions that were allocated against it. People do seem to have forgotten that, but it was there. Um, but it is, I think, to the regret of everybody that that wasn't advanced to a full strategy despite significant consultation. But there is an opportunity now to do that. But I just wanted to clarify that point. Mike, I'm sorry you don't have an extra minute. <laughs> Oh, regrets, I've had a few. <laughs> okay, so it's a, it has to be affordable, uh, 10,000 plus uh, per child, as Ms. Brogan pointed out, and others. But it also has to be accessible. And there was another scheme, uh, 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 which, which was about giving four hours a day uh, to preschool children. And the report claimed it had been extremely successful, uh, with a success rate of well over 90% in offering families places. However, that included, for example, a family who came to see me in my office in Newton Arts. They had been offered a place in Suffolk, in West Belfast. By the time they got there and back, they had about an hour and a half before it was time to go and collect the child. That was not success, in my view. So I hope this time we'll go forward in the spirit of outcome-based accountability programs for government. Uh, that's a results-based program. I'm not sure if any member remembers Mark Friedman coming to this building some years ago to talk about this results-based accountability scheme, which he is basically the father of. He wrote the book, Trying Hard Isn't Good Enough. And, and I think that's pertinent to what we do as a devolved administration. We do tend to say we're working night and day in this problem as if that's going to fix it. But working night and day does not guarantee success. 
We have to stop focusing just on the inputs and outputs of government. We have to focus on the outcomes. We're very good at the inputs. You know, we're spending a lot of money. We're doing this, we're doing that. And the outputs are, for example, uh, 1,000 people have attended awareness programs. Uh, 10,000 people have responded to our consultation. We've set up a unit in the department or an advisory group. But none of that guarantees the sort of outcomes uh, that we're looking for. And so I commend the outcomes in the motion and the amendment to prevent educational disadvantage, to support children with special educational needs, to promote emotional health and well-being amongst children, uh, to improve the terms and conditions of workers, to deliver accessible and affordable childcare. These are the measures by which this strategy, whenever it comes, should be measured uh, against. And as the economy spokesman, I have to say, Principal Deputy Speaker, I think one of the outcomes isn't just about child development, it is about our shocking levels uh, of economic inactivity. And the motion does talk about the positive impact on the economy of this strategy. There are a lot of people who are economically inactive who want to be active, and one of the big barriers is the lack of affordable and accessible childcare. So I believe it's not just a matter for the Minister uh, for, uh, for, for education. Uh, and as Mr Dodds uh, conceded, encouraged by Mr Butler, it is potentially for the whole of the executive. I can see a role for the Minister for Economies, for Communities, for Agriculture, Environment, Rural Affairs and for Justice. So I commend uh, the motion as amended, a proposed amendment from Mr Butler. Thank you, Mike. Um, Liz Kimmins is going to conclude and wind up on the debate. And Liz, you have 10 minutes to wind. Thank you. Gurma, I'll get for you last time, Corla, and just to congratulate you on your, your new role. I think you've handled this very well today, so thank you. And I just want to thank all the speakers here today. I think it's been a really, really positive debate. Um, my party brought this motion forward as childcare is a significant pr priority for us. But also, I think it's safe to say, given the unanimous support that we have had across the chamber, I think it is a priority for all parties, bar none. Um, the point is being well made on just how important early education and childcare is, um, and there is strong evidence to show just how crucial this window in a child's life is to their development. And it's also a crucial opportunity for identifying issues or difficulties a child may have and key to getting the right support in place at the earliest possible stage. As a working parent myself, like many others here have described, I'm acutely aware of the huge challenges, not only in access and childcare um, due to the lack of capacity, but also to the challenges that providers uh, are facing and those working right across the sector um, because those challenges continue to grow. So right, whether it is the rise in energy costs for the self-employed childminders um, who are operating from their own homes or in, in the childcare facilities um, who are, are trying to pay their staff fairly in, in the context of um, competing pay um, that are forcing them, as we've seen in the last week alone, to close their doors. Highly qualified and experienced workers are being lost to other jobs with better paying conditions, and it's becoming increasingly difficult to attract and retain staff, which we have heard um, on countless occasions just as part of this debate alone. So we need to ensure that staff working right across the sector are properly valued and respected for the excellent work they do, um, <clears throat> which has an increasingly wide and complex range of responsibilities. And it's no wonder that many of them are walk working away from a job that they love um, and I think it would be fair to say it's a vocation for many to jobs that are offering better paying conditions but maybe aren't giving them the same um, satisfaction and value for the work that they do. As we've heard from many speakers today, we cannot continue to push these rising costs onto already hard-pressed parents and families, and we need to put in place the right support to stop this cycle. Investing in a childcare strategy that is co-designed with families, providers, trade unions and workers to fully address the challenges they face will have far-reaching benefits right across society. The huge cost of childcare for families is untenable for the vast majority of parents, and we need to work together to deliver on this critical issue. Not only will the provision of affordable childcare, which is accessible to all, not just to those that can, who can afford it, and as others have mentioned, not just to those who have children of a certain age, um, will have a huge impact in boosting economic activity, particularly for workers, for women, sorry, which is not only important for our economy, but for the well-being of parents, 
to get back into the workplace in an, in an adult environment. Um, and I know myself, just coming to the end of, of my own children's maybe nine months to a year, you can't wait to get back into the workplace um, and, and to have that balance in your life. So this will also help, um, as, as we have discussed, the vast workforce challenges that we're seeing right across our key public services in health, education, infrastructure, which again can be taken up and fulfilled by predominantly women. And those are the, are the people who are largely facing the barriers that we've talked about today. And many have talked about the significant cost. The Minister has, has alluded to the, 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 the costings that he has to date. Um, of investing in childcare, but it is important that an understanding that of how, if we get this right, we have a real opportunity to transform society for the better. So, whilst there will be initial costs, and, and that um, is, can't be understated, the benefits of that will be right across every sector. I will, yeah. Because I know your time will be added on, but I'm glad you raised it because I didn't get a chance to address the Minister on this point. And, and I want to say thank you to the Department for the work they've done in terms of the costings. But what has been missing all along is the fact that savings could well be made, not just in the fiscal, but in the improvement of children's lives. Because we, if we get the early identification, the early support, then we'll guess what? Our ambition should be to reduce the burden on the, the special education budget, which is costing half a, uh, half a billion pounds at this point. So I would challenge, uh, ask, would you offer a, a challenge to the minister to ensure in those, those fiscal arrangements that it's not just the cost, but it's the savings that can be factored in too. Thank you. Sorry, the minister, does, the, the member doesn't have extra time, and interventions are meant to be brief. No problem. And, but I, th I thank the member for raising what is a very important point because I think, and this is something that we can look at right across in every area of our work, that if we can get it right at the earliest possible stage, we will see the benefits elsewhere. That will, um, and it's not all about cost, but we'll have far-reaching benefits, efficiencies that we will be able to see um, further down the line. Um, and I agree. I mean, we've, we've talked about this as a cross-cutting issue, and, and you know, certainly from our perspective, we have heard how ministers around the executive table are all up for this, um, and it will re require that cross-departmental -de working. However, I think it is very important to recognise and acknowledge that, as was unanimously agreed across this chamber last Tuesday, we are chronically underfunded, and the British government have a role to play in ensuring that we have the proper funding to deliver what is needed, proper funding that will enable us to do what we have committed to do in delivering on this particular issue of childcare and early education. And we do need to continue to speak in one voice in lobbying the British Treasury on this, because if we want to do this, we want to get it right, and we want to ensure that we are properly resourced to do that, because once we have the proper resources, we can do so much more, um, and, and we will be able to deliver properly for the people we serve. So just, I want to thank everyone who has spoken in support of the motion today. I think the motion has set a really ambitious tone for this new Assembly, and key to this, as I have said, is working together to deliver quality, affordable, accessible and sustainable childcare, and I would ask all parties to support this motion. Thank you, Liz. So the question is that the amendment standing in the name of Robbie Butler be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary if any, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the motion, as amended, be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary of any no. The ayes have it. The question is that the motion starting on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. The motion is passed. Can the House just take its seats for a moment? Do we make changes at the top table?